This week, Baidu robo-taxis in Wuhan, China won't let you ride if you are pregnant, elderly, infirm, or have a bad heart. It's basically just saying, no Jameses. Electric school buses in Oakland, California will be able to supply enough grid power for 300 homes. The only downside is the haunting melody of the wheels on the school bus go round and round reverberating throughout the grid. Sodium ion batteries are now powering the grid in China. They can charge from 0 to 90% in 12 minutes. Why ride that's almost as fast as my defibrillator? This week, we will have your summer grid reliability forecast. Once again, our home here in Canada is on the list for possible rolling blackouts. It all depends on how many times James has to use that defibrillator. Ah! <coughs> it's going to be a big show. All that and more on this edition of The Clean Energy Show. And also, this week, the IEA is expecting big growth this year, even as the EU ponders raising their tariffs on Chinese-made EVs. Uh, they're only 10% now. Biden's raised them to 100%, so that seems small by comparison. Um, plus the lightning round and all that and a lot more. If you're doing the show, be sure to subscribe on your podcast app or however you're listening to the show, because we put these out every week, and you'll get them automatically. We love to talk about the weather, but I, I don't know why, because... Because we're old. People could be listening to this a month from now. But uh, it's rainy and cold, but at least there's been no forest fire smoke. Uh, near us, but they do continue to rage here in Canada and the smoke is spreading all over the place again. Fort McMurray in Alberta, home of the oil sands, has been on a, an evacuation alert, but so far they've been able to stave that off and uh, not have to evacuate. But there, yeah, there was a town in BC that was evacuated. Um, Nelson, you know, it's, in northern it's gonna BC. Be Nelson, BC. Yeah. Um, another big forest fire season, but it, it's been rainy and cold here, and I think a little bit rainy and cold in some other places. So hopefully that helps. It's hard to have uh, sympathy for the oil sands having to run for their lives, uh, considering some of the things we talk about on the show and how they are not this, trying to help at all. Yeah is the very definition of irony right there. And some of the international news outlets have picked up on that irony. Uh, Brian, my partner, was served with an ad on YouTube saying that Elon Musk is being made out as a monster just for being an advocate for free speech. Uh, I thought that was the weirdest <laughs> ad I've ever heard of on YouTube. Yeah. Um, did he pay for it? Did you pay for it? Who paid for that? I mean, what kind yeah, of a fanboy would take out an ad like that? And I half wonder if he did. <laughs> Cause it could be. I have no idea. When you're uh, a narcissist, you know, things like that happen. Oh, I have a product review this week. Isn't that exciting? I don't usually do this for on the show, but Ooh, I had nice. a, I was at the store, grocery store, which I don't go to very often at all since the pandemic. Not that I'm staying home yeah, because I'm scared. It's just my habits yeah. have changed. My partner, we actually continued ordering online. It doesn't always work out for us because they're out of half the things somehow. And they substitute yeah, yeah. things we don't want, but... They always do weird substitutions. But yeah, we get a lot of our groceries delivered as well. It's kind of, you know, and, and my partner spends so much time online picking it out that I think she could go to the store and save an hour by just going to the store shop because it takes so long. I don't know why. I think she's just looking... I don't know. Maybe it's not well organized. But anyway, I was there minding my own business. For some reason, it's not as easy as it should be. Yes, I don't know. I have that same easy. problem where it's like, okay, we're going to order our groceries again online. This is so much easier than going to the store. But some reason, it takes a long time and it's irritating. You should so we end up kind of doing half and half, I think. You should be able to just tick off the things, you know, you've ordered this before, want it again this week or, you know, and... Yeah, our, our superstore has that. So we have that. So our frequently ordered items always pop up. Uh, but I don't know, for some reason, it's harder than it should be. But I mean, I guess we're just lazy 21st century sure. slobs. Yeah, yeah, first world <laughs> problems. So I was minding my own business. I was there. I don't know why I was there. I needed a couple. I needed bread. I have a specific bread that's always sold out. It's uh, harvest protein bread. And they discontinued my, my previous bread. I can't have any bread, Brian. It's uh, <laughs> I need a good start in the morning and I'm eating toast. So I need to be good bread that fills me. Uh, either with fiber or protein. But I found this meatless frozen pasta. Uh, this is from President's Choice here in Canada, and it is called Beefless Pasta Bake. This is something I'll eat at least a couple times a week. Uh, I'm here alone in the house. Uh, I need something quick to eat. I'll probably do that today. I need something to eat today. Family's gone. Um, yeah, 
and it's 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 plant based, which is why I bring it up, because it's removed the cow, which is not very efficient for the environment, as we all know. Yeah, and I would love to eat. I would love to be a vegetarian. It's not going to happen, I don't think. I'm I'm pretty picky. I'm finicky. Uh, but that's also why I don't like meat is because I know there's, I've been at a kill plant and I know, you know, and you, you get that occasional bone in there once a couple of years and it turns you off if, even if you are a carnivore, but this, this, I swore they made a mistake. It tasted so much like actual beef in the past of like a, a tomato sauce with, you know, a little bit of cheese, which is also fake, which I didn't know because they don't advertise that, but it's, uh, there's a... Regatta cheese that is fake, so it's I don't know if it's precision fermentation. It probably is, uh, but you know I love to see that. So I I did a plant based search, which I do every couple of years, and they got a lot of products uh, from uh, chocolate chips. They got fishless fish cakes. Uh, <laughs> they call it the regatta cheese alternative, by the way. I don't know what that means. Um, I guess if you're smart, you could decipher it from the ingredients. They have a sausageless. Sausageless sausage rolls. Boy, that is hard to say. That should be a warm up for an actor <laughs> going on stage. Uh, marshmallows, which, as we know, contain animals, uh, <laughs> a lot of them. Uh, beefless, beefless, <laughs> I can't say this. Beefless, <laughs> why? <laughs> we have to start doing this when I'm drunk. Beefless broth, uh, beefless ground beef. Uh, that has no brand brand name. Like it doesn't say, um, you know, uh, Beyond Meat or anything like that. They're just their own uh, grocery chain store products. Chocolate cake, chocolate chips without, you know, anything. Taco filling, pulled pork alternative, all kinds of things. And this wasn't any more expensive. That's another thing. It was, you know, along with other things that had meat in it, it was the same price, which is really good to see because we knew that was coming. And so... And, and, you know, there's a lot, of, not a lot of meat in these things, but it is filling. So I prefer to have, you know, a meat in it just so that uh, this 380 uh, calorie frozen dinner could fill me. And it has 25 grams of protein, which is really good. You're not sacrificing any protein. In fact, it seems like maybe you're getting a little bit extra because for 20, 380 uh, calories, that's not bad. Yeah, that sounds good. As I said in the open, Baidu uh, Robotaxis in Wuhan, China, they're testing. Half of them have uh, safety drivers, half do not. Um, 500 of them are on the road, and that's going to double by the end of the year. This is a test, much like uh, Waymo is doing in Californian cities and uh, uh, Phoenix. So CNBC did a report and, and tried out the service, and I was startled by who can and cannot use these robo taxis. But not everyone can ride. A notice pops up and warns no young children, pregnant women, elderly, the infirm, or anyone with a bad heart. So, not me. <laughs> you could argue I'm infirm, have a bad heart, and even argue that I'm pregnant, I suppose. Uh, so, that's, you know, they don't do that in, uh, in San Francisco, as far as I know. Yeah, well, they, they could put it, you could open the door and there could be a chart, you know, you have to be this tall to ride, something like that. Yeah, well, <laughs> your heart has to be this stable to ride. <laughs> Is that because it scares you? I mean, what's with the heart business? Yeah, I don't know. I guess they're hoping that if there is an accident, that it's healthy people that are involved and they'll so, have less chance of them to die. I don't know. Less, less uh, chance of bad things. Uh, I listened to a podcast, I believe it was the Dr. Volt's podcast, and they were talking about a with a heat pump manufacturer, and uh, I got some thoughts from that. It, the guy said, you know, the guest said that's not very efficient to heat to transfer heat by air, which is what our furnaces do, which is what your furnace mm -hmm. does. It's an air force system. Um, so yeah, what they do is they they'll put a little um, heat pump exchange unit in every room. And that's often what they do in Europe instead of putting in a forced air thing, or sometimes I guess it's even possible to heat water and put that through uh, radiators. But usually it's a little system and it's got um, a refrigerant in it and it comes and, you know, exchanges the, uh, you know, the heat from the heat pump or the cool from the air conditioning. Yeah. And if it's so summer. sort of like a wall unit in each room rather than a central one. Yeah. It's not that big and it's elegant looking and the outdoor unit is elegant looking. And 
I I don't know. It's just we're if we're worried about you know getting all of the efficiency out of these things, maybe that's the way to go. If you're building a new house in a cold climate, Brian and I live in a very cold climate in the winter time. Uh, yeah, that might be one way to go to have a well insulated, well sealed house with you know. But the problem continues that, and this is true all over the world that you know, installers aren't very good at this. So when you have a problem with a heat pump, it's usually the installer making a mistake from what I've been hearing on these podcasts. And it's hard to train them. It's hard to certify them if they're not doing enough of them. It's like, why would I waste my time if Brian Stockton's one of three people in the city to, to get one, you know? Yeah. Well, I think we discussed in Sweden, they went big on heat pumps in Sweden back way in the 80s. And yeah, they had some problems in the first couple of years and, and people were concerned that these heat pumps don't work. But so Sweden spent a lot of money on training, uh, you know, and education and then uh, everything got better. I think that's what we're going to need to do in Canada and the northern U.S. and the northeast and the southeast U.S., where heat pumps are popular, replacing heating oil. Well, I watched a YouTube video from Mika Dahl, uh, the electric writer and contributor. He also has a website, ebikeschool.com. He does all the two-wheeled transportation for electric, and he has his own channel, Ebike School, on YouTube as well. And he did a little diary of his trip to Taipei, because Gagoro, the scooter company that has swappable batteries, uh, paid for him to come out. He was the only foreign uh, tourist or Western tourist to go out there. And yeah, he had a little uh, uh, travel log video of what it was like to use the Kagura scooter. And I didn't know that the battery swap stations, when you pull up in your scooter, uh, it's like this big vending machine of batteries, bread loaf size batteries. It actually starts communicating with your scooter as soon as you pull in. So it knows who you are right away. Nice. And it also diagnoses any problems you might have with the scooter as well. So if there's any problems, it'll say, hey, you know, maybe you hey. should swap it out or take it in or something like that. Uh, each battery, by the way, weighs 20 pounds. He toured the factory, although they didn't let him... Sh they didn't show a lot, but some of the things that move on a conveyor belt are like this little robot that moves on a track and it's powered by Gagoro scooter batteries. They just swap them out and that's how their factory works. And they, yeah, they are making their own battery. So it's essentially a battery company that happens to have um, scooters. I mean, you could argue Tesla's a software company that happens to have cars. Sometimes, yeah. you know, especially lately, that argument is being made. Uh, so he toured type on, and this is a clip of him at a so-called scooter waterfall. It's like this down ramp coming off a highway that is only for scooters. And it's not small. <laughs> it's packed with scooters <laughs> because that's the way it is in some parts of the world. There's a large, um, you know, use of two wheeled and three wheeled transportation, which is why it's kind of cool to see them electrifying very quickly in some places. Um, yeah, but he's, he, this waterfall it looks like a waterfall because all these scooters are coming down this ramp. It looks like the illusion of a waterfall. And this is a, <laughs> a clip of what it was like for him standing there. This is an off ramp from a scooter on the highway coming across the river in from New Taipei City. These are all commuters and there's something like, you know, 10% of these scooters are electric, but the vast, vast majority are gas powered. You can hear all of those engines. You can taste the exhaust in the air. We've been here for about 10 minutes or so taking pictures. I'm starting to get a headache just from all of this exhaust. It really shows you how important it is, why we do what we do, why it is so critical to move all of these scooters towards electrification to reduce these emissions just on the small scale from day to day, the health impacts and the long term for our planet. And that's happening, Brian. They are rapidly going to, uh, um, you know, two-wheeled uh, transportation that is electrified and it is quieter uh, in many ways more convenient because you don't have to do as much maintenance on it you don't have to do any maintenance uh, and you can swap the batteries pretty easily if your country has these swappable battery stations and even if you don't there's still electrified uh, two-wheel transportation that is taking off in a lot of places of the world and this is happening very rapidly this is actually displacing i think a lot of um, i think it's a million barrels of gas and it could be two million by next year so it's significant per day yeah and even places like new york putting in uh, chargers for electric bicycles that's more the thing here in north america electric bikes i think he went to the ride one up factory as well in china 
um, which is where, I, you know, my electric bike is a ride one up. Um, yeah, this is all fun stuff. Uh, all right. So we have the summer grid forecast from Power Magazine. So NERC does this every year, the National Energy uh, Council from uh, the U.S. Okay. They do an assessment. Are you sure about that? <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure about that. Um, they have an assessment every year of where the possible grid problems are going to be over the summer. And uh, so, yeah, this is always interesting to us because this is the second time that our province, Saskatchewan, here in Canada, is on the list. And the issue around here could be if we have uh, long periods of intense heat because uh, that's, you know, where we run into grid problems is the uh, everyone's air conditioners. Uh, working overtime. British Columbia in Canada is also on the list, and that's because of droughts. So they have a lot of hydroelectric power, but they have not been getting the uh, rainfall that they usually get. So, you know, they're not necessarily going to have enough hydropower on display. But again, all of these things, it really depends on what happens. You know, you have to have certain conditions, certain dominoes have to fall into place where there's high demand and say a lack of wind if you've got a lot of wind power in your grid so in the u.s uh, npcc in new england is on the list um, miso is on the list that's sort of like the midwest michigan area and then further down south texas ERCOT, which is kind of their own grid texas has um a lot of new stuff going on to the grid like they have a lot of you know wind and solar going on to the grid but uh you know they're worried about an increase in things like crypto mining that's very big in a in a place like texas so um you know there's a lot of new power coming onto the grid but at the same time there's a lot of power being retired you know as we talk about almost every week coal plants are shutting down um so you know this is a certainly a solvable problem um you know, as more, you know, wind and solar and batteries come onto the grid, but it's got to be balanced with uh, shutting down some of these things. Um, California is also on the list and the Southwest kind of between Texas and California um, is also on the list. So again, you know, it didn't really, wasn't really a problem last time we were on this list, but you know, it all just depends on, uh, you know, what happens basically uh, the weather. Uh, it's going to depend on the weather. A long heat wave. Uh, now, so far, it's been unseasonably cool, which is not something I like <laughs> for my summer, yeah. for my short Canadian <laughs> summer. I expect more. Um, but it does happen. It does happen. It's not that unusual. Um, I was surprised last year that Canada, who which has a tremendous amount of hydropower, actually imported more power overall last year than an exporter, which is very unusual. It's usually an exporter because it's yeah. got so much hydro. But then that hydro is dependent on uh, weather and climate. And if we're seeing droughts, and I, I'm, I never realized how dependent hydropower was because that's the only low carbon power we have in our province is hydropower. I mean, we've got a little bit of solar and a little bit of wind, but traditionally as growing up, that was the only thing that wasn't burning smoke into the air constantly. Yeah, and it just hasn't generally been a problem. Like there's been enough rain in the last few decades. And uh, but of course, the climate is changing and the weather patterns in terms of rain are changing. So, you know, California, we know, has had similar problems with drought and, and their hydropower. And uh, there's a related story here um, from Vietnam. Uh, I got this from nine to five Mac and uh, they're worried about you know, possible rolling blackouts in Vietnam this summer for similar reasons. And they're asking uh, the big factories like Foxconn. So Apple makes a lot of their products in Vietnam. There's a big Foxconn factory. So some of these large factories, they're asking them to cut their power by 30% because apparently last summer there were big blackouts. There was uh, too much demand and this, you know, caused a lot of problems. You don't want these massive factories that are churning out um, iPhones or whatever to have to go idle. So the hope is that if the big factories can cut their use by 30%, that maybe they can get through the summer. Maybe this is going to start motivating uh, industry to get batteries on site and to also invest in more renewables. Because I know they're not going to want to face that situation, obviously. So maybe that will motivate them to do something because it will help their bottom line. And, you know, yeah. they're getting cheaper and batteries are getting cheaper. Uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, you know, people are going to blame that on renewables. 
because they always do. Well, this is the problem because, of course, if we do end up with rolling blackouts this summer in our province, they're going to blame it on the, you know, the the 10 wind turbines that we have and the <laughs> tiny solar farm that we have. Even though this is a largely a, a fossil fueled place, we know that that's what the politicians are going to do. So I think, what do we have, one hydro dam in this province? Yeah, I think just one up north. And yep. they're they're taking that same river system and they're, they want to do irrigation now. And they're thinking everything's going to be fine. Um, yeah, but it's not. Yeah, there's it's not likely not enough water to do irrigation and hydropower. Especially going but, uh, forward, Brian, into the future. Uh, our place here is going to become hotter, and uh, especially in the summer, and drier. Potentially drier. Uh, so that is, you know, Ill, ill-fated. Uh, China's first large-scale sodium ion battery charges to 90% in 12 minutes. Now, sodium ion batteries, this is something that China, the world's largest uh, battery manufacturers in China, are doing this. Um, they're switching from lithium, which is very similar to sodium, and it's cheaper and more abundant, And uh, but there's different characteristics to that chemistry of the battery. There's some drawbacks, but China's first major sodium ion battery energy storage system, that is a big battery that powers the grid, not a car or anything like that, but big container-sized um, modules by the power station that charges up when there's excess power from either renewables or at night when it's less used, and then it gives it off when the grid needs it. This is located in Nanning. Um, <laughs> I, I don't. I can't pronounce Chinese words, Brian. It's located in China, somewhere in China, a big country. Same size as the United States. We need States. an AI co-host that can do well, all this. That seconds away. Have you seen the latest developments? I mean, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And Scarlett Johansson is suing. I could be AI right now. Oh, you probably are. I have no no variable proof. I have no way to, you know, I, I need no some obscure enough. fact from your childhood. You should give that to us now so that <laughs> that I can test the AI in the future to know if you're real. <laughs> So the initial capacity is 10 megawatt hours. Expected total capacity is 100 megawatt hours in the future as they deploy this and get it built. And it uses 210 amp hour sodium ion cells, 22,000 cells, cells charged to 90%, 12 minutes, as I said. And when fully developed, it could release 73,000 megawatt hours of clean electricity yearly. That is a lot of homes can be powered by that if necessary. So the potential to power 35,000 homes and cut CO2 emissions by uh, 50,000 tons a year by use, making better use of uh, clean energy um, and less coal, I guess. So energy conservation efficiency exceeds 92%. So that's, you know, the charging up and the discharging that you lose a little bit, 92% is pretty yeah. good. That's good. Uh, apparently, it's very comparable with lithium ion systems. And, but there's a cost reduction of 20 to 30 percent possible when you deploy these things uh, large scale. So, because this is the first that they expect the cost to go down, and believe me, they will, because they have been like crazy. A senior engineer, at China Southern Power Grid, said this can be achieved through further improvements in sodium ion battery structure, manufacturing uh, processes material utilization and the life cycle, which means, you know, recycling these when they're done, uh, the minerals in them, and lowering the energy storage cost per kilowatt hour of electricity. They are cost effective, these sodium ion batteries, and use abundant raw materials, but uh, the challenges for them include lower energy density, so you have to have a bigger battery, which is perfect for the grid. It's not so good for a car, at least a high range car, lower range, fine, city cars, but, uh, and there is some in city cars now, just starting, uh, but yeah, it doesn't matter so much when you're dealing with the grid, and we need, we need batteries on the grid to make renewables, you know, go up to something like 90% or something like that of the grid, whatever we can get yeah. to. It's super fun to see all these different chemistries and, and how they're going to play out, and lots of people in labs throwing together, you know, chocolate and peanut butter and seeing how it works together. And sometimes it sure does. Oh, it's time to dip into the mailbag. Ah, here's one. It says, hey guys, I heard you don't know, uh, you don't know where the, about the news of the city or rather the school district of Oakland. Okay. Yeah. So Oakland is, uh, is getting school buses. 
Yeah, electric ones. Electric school buses, 100% of them are going to be. This is the first city in the United States to go all their school buses completely electric. So this is from Chuck. Uh, thanks, Chuck. The LA Times has a story about this, Brian. And uh, yeah, this is this is where the story started on, on Facebook. This is a Facebook post. Would you read the Facebook post from uh, the Oakland people here who uh, announced yeah. this? Yeah, so it says, we are thrilled to announce that Oakland has become the first school district in the country to have a fully electric fleet of school buses, thanks to our partnership with Zoom, Z-U-M or Z-U-M for our American listeners. Our 74 electric school buses not only provide cleaner, quieter transportation for our students, but also help reduce harmful emissions and air pollution, which disproportionately affect Oakland families. This initiative is a game changer, ensuring our students have a healthier and more equitable chance at success in the classroom. And then they thank their partners at Zoom and the uh, electric utility. Yeah, this is a, a big deal. This is a, a good news story, and I, I wonder how they were able to do it so quickly. But uh, remember, the diesel emissions in school buses not only affect them when they're parked outside the school running, when you're standing there waiting to get on, but it also goes inside the school bus because they've measured these things and it is not good for children's development and uh, diesel emissions are not good for anyone. So it's really good to see uh, the buses will be quiet and they'll also, I'm understood, they'll power the grid. They'll actually work at powering the grid uh, when they're not in use. Yeah, so Bloomberg has a nice story about this as well, and they're sort of explaining the schedule of it. You know, the bus drivers uh, drop the kids off in the morning, and then they go park in the yard. They get charged up with solar power because that's the perfect time for that. And, you know, they end their workday at a certain charge, which then, you know, they just plug into the grid. And all the school buses together, it's enough to power about 300 homes. So, you know, they can feed that power into the grid. And, you know, that might make the difference between a, a blackout, perhaps, if, uh, sure. you know, there's shortage of power on the grid. Yeah. Is it 300 homes per school bus or 300 homes for all the school buses? No, in total. Yeah. That doesn't seem like a lot. But, I mean, that's probably, like, permanent rather than, you know, for short term. Usually you're, when we're talking about these things, it's a short term thing. Like, the grid really needs some electricity now or it'll crash and then it gets it from batteries. And, yeah. And then, you know, school buses, I imagine, are home by 4.30 or 5. That's when the uh, peak of the power yep. demand peak starts demand to happen. Of the grid, yep. So you can drain them further. You're not going to worry about not using them. And then when there's low demand for electricity, and usually when electricity is cheaper is in places like California, you charge them up overnight and you're ready to go and do the whole thing over again the next day. Of course, on weekends, you're not using the school buses, and that works out really well. We'd love, love to hear from our listeners. Please contact us by email, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. And you can also leave us a voicemail at speakpipe.com slash clean energy show. Please let us know your thoughts. Okay, so we have another good news story. This is from the International Energy Agency, who always has lots to say. Um, very good statistics here for how new clean energy is shaping up around the world. They say clean electricity accounted for around 80% of all new capacity additions to the grid in 2023. And uh, electric vehicles getting close to around 20% in terms of market share for new vehicles sold globally around the world. Uh, China's bumping up around 50% pretty soon. Um, and all this has huge economic uh, impact. So they're estimating that about 10% of the global GDP growth, so whatever the economy grew in 2023, 10% of that was from clean energy. So That's pretty um, significant it, already. Yeah. Like, we're just it, getting started. It's saying it's around the size of the economy of the Czech Republic. That was what was the, the green part of GDP growth, uh, basically like a, a adding a country the size of the Czech Republic to uh, global output. So, yeah, they're also expecting uh, big things for electric vehicles in 2024. Um, getting close to 20% in 2023, and they expect it to go over 20% in 2024. And um, yeah, possibly a big 
bump this year. I know there's been tons of electric car announcements. We haven't talked about too many of them because there's kind of too many to talk about. But uh, lots Do you remember of, when that yeah. wasn't the case when we started this yeah. podcast? Every time yeah, there was a car, ago. we had a whole show on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> practically. And now... It's like, yeah, it's not even worth mentioning in a lightning round, practically, because there's just so yeah. much coming out. No, I just saw one of the new electric Konas this morning um, on our walk. It looked great. I, I love the new Kona. Kia and Hyundai, they've got new new ones coming out. Uh, everybody's got new EVs coming out. Yeah, and uh, the Hyundai Korean, uh, Hyundai and Kia ones are usually, the better ones are faster charging, and everyone has to use that. And there, I'd be interested to see how many they make this year. You know, because it seems like the demand is really there for them because they have the best cars in some ways. Yeah. No, and there was a story about General Motors this week as well. They're really planning, they say, to put the pedal to the metal this year and go hard on the EV production. Uh, so I don't trust you don't it. Believe it. I don't I don't trust <laughs> it. I mean I hope for I'm hopeful. Yeah. I hope they do. Let's hope. But you know, they're also saying, well, we're going to slow down our plans and make hybrids. Well, screw you. I mean, if it wasn't for 100% tariffs on Chinese vehicles, I mean, you'd be gone in 10 years. Like, they would just slowly take over the market as people, you know, became accustomed to them. It's not going to happen instantly. Uh, but people will, you know, like like Kia and Hyundai did. People didn't trust them. Toyota wasn't trusted in the 70s, and it took a while. But once you trust them and see how great they are, and then they have the infrastructure here to, to service them uh, and sell them, well, it's a different story. And, you know, the people selling... Uh, cars at GM dealerships and Ford dealerships, they don't know anything about electric cars. They don't want to know anything about electric cars. They don't want to sell an electric car. They're the wrong people. That's the way it yeah, is. Yeah, and of, of course, we're in the exact place in North America for that. This, you know, we're we're going to be one of the last places. That there are good examples. Over. And if you follow Facebook yeah. pages and, and different groups, you can find out, you know, like I found out the guy in my dealership who actually owned one, which was great. Uh, that I didn't expect ever to happen, but that was fantastic. And, you know, you can find people like that and you can find good dealerships. There are, they do exist. Yeah. And hopefully like in places like California, I'm sure. Colorado, it's, it's some in New York state, better. there's places. Absolutely. Yeah. But not, not everybody. Uh, this new segment, I've got a new segment here. It's called uh, TikTok Father, Fodder. TikTok Fodder. This is stuff that I know will fly off the shelf on our TikTok channel. So I've nice. got a, a few little stories here to energetically tell you about uh, and then chop the breaths out of my my breathing because, you know, you can't have breathing on TikTok. <laughs> that has to be edited out. Yeah, and you can chop out uh, when you have to use the defibrillator, that kind of thing. Yes, <laughs> as long as I keep going. So it, by 2042, China will no longer need to mine new mineral materials because of its mature battery recycling mark says the founder uh, of the biggest battery manufacturer in the world catl china based he says that by 2042 china will not need to mine new materials we heard a figure i think of 2063 before there was one study now we're hearing 2042 which is quite remarkable and and yeah that's they're by, we don't know about Chinese uh, recycling. Of, uh, we haven't covered it on the show. We don't have much information about it. But apparently he's pretty confident in it and says they're more advanced than we are in North America. And that's going to happen. So, yeah, batteries are amazing. I'm that's the, This is the year of the battery for James. Like, I'm just amazed at the fact that not only can we recycle 95% of the minerals, they'll go into batteries that were hold more energy than the ones they came from. So it's like more than 100% recycling. That's amazing. So Germany uses the same volume of land to grow Christmas trees as it does for solar electricity. And Germany, even though it's kind of cloudy, has a lot of solar. Well, they, they started this in the early 2000s. They started manufacturing, then they got, you know, China started manufacturing solar panels and dumping them onto the market. And if you ask me, I think that turned out to be a good thing, at least for the the world, if that didn't happen. And I feel kind of the way, same way about electric cars. Like, you know, let's take your electric cars because they seem like they're pretty good. Like one looks like a Porsche Taycan, 
that uh, the battery, there's this um, manufacturer in China that makes phones, decided they would make cars like Apple was going to. Well, they just did it. They did it. They, they put out 10,000 of them already, and they're going to put out 100,000 by the end of the year. And except for the headlights, which are a little wonky, the thing looks really gorgeous. Like, you know, like it's not Tycon priced. It's not Porsche priced. It's uh, as a car for everybody. It's like a Model 3. And it looks really good, and it's got a lot of features. And yeah, they're working some things out. It's the first models, but it would be interesting to see a year or two from now just how you know reliable the new models are and how they've worked out any kinks that may or may not be there. So yeah, if you look at this map of land use in Germany, it's you hear this so much. This is a talking point of the anti anti uh, clean energy movement is that you know it's going to take up land. Uh, but, you know, nobody's saying, oh, well, we better stop growing Christmas trees because it's taking up agricultural land. No, no one says that. Yeah. And it turns out it's kind of the exact same amount. This is a wonderful graph here. And they represent the amount of land used for Christmas trees by this tiny little circle. And then there's a tiny little circle next to it, which is the amount of land used for solar PV. It's about the same. And, you know tiny compared to the rest of the country. And while we're at it in the UK, uh, this is a reminder that, you know, the amount of solar in the UK takes up less than the land that is used for golf courses. Solar farms really aren't a risk to food security. Uh, you know, what is a risk to food security? Climate change. Yeah. That's a risk to food security big time. And if we start seeing droughts around here, we're not going to have very much grain crops coming out of our region of the world. Uh, to get to the target that solar needs to be in the UK to decarbonize the grid, it's only going to be half a percent to 0.7% of farmland. And that's the same case for Alberta next door to us, which is a big uh, fight going on saying it's going to take up all our agricultural land. Because that's that goes around and people start believing it. It's not true. It's a small fraction, and we're going to have plenty of that as I start eating more products like this with fake meat in them. That land can go happily to, uh, to solar panels or whatever. Uh, okay, so um, we've been speaking a bit about the tariffs in the United States for um, Chinese electric vehicles. This is something that uh, Biden introduced recently. They did have a 25% tariff um, to try and keep Chinese EVs at bay in America. It went up to 100%, which is a little bit insane. And now in the EU, they're considering something similar right now. It's around a 10% tariff. And so Chinese EVs are starting to make inroads into Europe, but they're looking at raising that to 25 or 30%. And the reasoning being is they're not really sure how much these cars are being subsidized by the Chinese government. Uh, you know, we, we do know that there is some subsidy. They're trying to figure out how much. And if it's a massive subsidy, then it is a bit of an unfair advantage that the, the Chinese makers would have going into the, the European market. So that's the reasoning behind it. It's not been enacted yet, but it looks like it's coming. Uh, I'm actually surprised that 10%, you know, like... I don't think that's going to slow down the Chinese EVs at all. It's just a matter of trust and something new coming to the market. And um, But, you know, once that starts happening, it takes a few years, but it, it's unstoppable once it does. Yeah, you know, it's not so easy to start selling cars in a new country. You really have to establish a whole network of, you know, dealers or, you know, repair places and so on. Um, but, you know, it, it will come eventually for the Chinese automakers unless they're kept out with tariffs. It's time for the lightning round. The lightning round is a fast-paced look at the latest headlines in climate clean energy and transportation. The organization Recurrent Study, they did a study that finds that just 2.5% of EVs have had their battery replaced. That sounds like maybe a lot, but newer models of EVs after uh, 2016 and onward only need 1% of their batteries replaced. And remember, batteries in EVs have an eight-year warranty. People are kind of afraid to buy used EVs. That's why the used EV market is not doing so great. Um, you know, I kind of feel that way sometimes, you know, when your yeah. Chevy Bolt batteries have been replaced. And a lot of those are probably Chevy Bolt batteries because they were ineffective. 
Yeah, and there's greater supply of used EVs now that EVs have been around a few years. So, um, yeah, I can understand people being nervous about this. But as we've discussed on the show, the battery in an EV typically lasts the life of the vehicle. That's correct. And I've got one going on 11 and a half years so far. According to Clean Technica, the global fleet of combustion vehicles is set to peak between 2026 and 2028, and then it'll start falling. So, yeah, there's still adding more and more cars to the road that have engines in them and they're not being retired, but that's going to peak as little as a year and a half from now, and then it's going to start to fall. Yeah, and we hit the peak of sales for combustion vehicles two, three years ago, something like that. So the sale of new combustion vehicles has already started to fall. But of course, there's an established fleet around the world of probably a couple of billion combustion vehicles. And that fleet, it's going to peak apparently between 2026 and 2028 and then start heading downward. And the vehicles made in the last 20 years are lasting longer. That's one of the reasons. And also people are using less vehicles, although that is starting to change in the last year. People are using more of their vehicles. I think the pandemic had something to do with that with just individual, uh, you know, getting around individually was a, was a preference for some people. Uh, Ethiopia, as reported before on this show, uh, began banning the import of internal combustion engine vehicles, gas and diesel vehicles. Why? Because they can't afford to spend $5 billion annually on oil imports. Yes, if you don't have the oil, it kind of sucks. So EVs are already to my surprise, about 10% of Ethiopia's auto fleet, not sales, but of their fleet. So that's yeah. really good. That's impressive. New research shows that gas stove emissions contribute to 19,000 deaths annually. That's a, article, a new article in Ars Technica. 19,000 deaths from gas stoves. And of course, this is a culture war issue in the United States as the election nears. You know, taking away your gas stoves, and we mentioned last week, you had a story about restaurants fighting that in California and winning uh, the right to have the gas. So it's kind of depressing. Oh, it's time for a CS Fast Fact. You can make batteries for 11 smart cars with one Hummer EV battery. That is the Hummer EV from General Motors, the big, hulking, masculine expression Beast. yes tank military-like vehicle i guess because it was part of the military apparently sometimes so yeah that's uh, 17.6 kilowatt hours in a little car of battery and 205 and it's not efficient brian it's been tested against some pickup trucks and it's not efficient at all it's a it's as wasteful as the gas and diesel hummers were so that's 900 kilograms of battery viz 4,500 kilograms, five times more. Uh, global EV sales, there's some stats coming out now, rose 21% in April 2024 compared to April 2023. Not bad. Pretty good. One fifth more. Uh, EV sales in China are jumping up from 30% in 2024 through April in Europe and North America sales grew by 8 and 7%, so not as fast here in the Western world. Uh, wind turbines pay back the emissions to make them in one and a half years, says Renew Economy. One and a half years to get the payback on wind turbines. France is building 220 kilometers of high-speed rail for the same cost that San Francisco is building just three kilometers. Construction costs and permitting and all that is off the charts in California. Yeah, some of these big rail projects, subway projects, man, it's crazy how expensive they are. Uh, but I guess it's not that way in every country. Who knows uh, why this is happening? But uh, we need more rail. It's a shame that some of these projects are so damn expensive. And that's our show for this week. Uh, we've run out of material. It's a shorter show this week, I'm afraid. Uh, but yeah, thanks for listening. We appreciate everyone who listens to the show. If you can, rate and review us on iTunes. That is just something you could do to make me happy. And why wouldn't you want to do that? Yeah, and you can contact us, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com or on social media. We're Clean Energy Pod. We have various videos on TikTok, YouTube, sometimes special content uh, not featured on the podcast. Yes, I apologize if you were expecting more show but we have to uh, take it easy because I've got other things to do this week, Brian. 
It's busy. I've got a yarn sale coming up this week, and my wife has bursitis. You know what that is? No. no. It's, it's horrible. <laughs> She's basically <laughs> completely crippled. Oh, no. She tried planting something and hurt her shoulder, and it's been an intense pain, and it's not getting any better a week later, and she can't sleep, and it's just uh, – but now I have to do the garage sale, so – uh, and it's important because we need that money for various things and, and and to move around the house, which would be very nice if I could do that. It'd be quite a luxury to uh, go from A to B without tripping on something. So we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening. Yeah, see you next week. Global warming is a serious problem. Climate change at this moment is a road to death. You have placed the blame clean energy on show. wealthy countries. In great measure, yes. The best we can do is hope the boys at the Clean Energy Show can save the world. I think they can. Bye-bye.